Here in China, there is such darkness. But even in the midst of this darkness, we are experiencing God's victory. I became a believer 10 years ago. I heard about Christ when I was on business trip. After that, my entire family came to Christ. But we are not free to share our faith with others. If you are spreading the gospel, Chinese government treat you as a criminal. They want to control the number of Christians. They want to control what God is doing. I hear from time to time of brothers and sisters being persecuted and arrested. Last week, a good friend of mine was taken by the Chinese police. He was questioned and then beaten so bad that he almost died, all because of spreading the gospel. In the city, everywhere you look, there are apartments. Since we can't meet in public, our ministry takes place in the buildings we live in. In the evenings, brothers and sisters in Christ gather together in homes. This is our church. If you ask people on the street, most have never heard of Christ or read the Bible. No one in their family is a believer. The dangers here are driven by darkness, and that darkness can be quite fearful, especially when I think of my family. But God never fears, and He will overcome. So I want to go and share, despite being at risk. I minister to the neighbors that live next door or upstairs. I visit them often. I listen and I share in their life. When I get the chance, I tell the story of Jesus Christ and we pray. And the Holy Spirit works. Every week, we see new people come to Christ. Only two weeks ago, an amazing thing happened we discovered there was another home church meeting at the top of this very same building. In our own building, God had brought up another fellowship. That really humbled us. In the midst of all the darkness, all the persecution, the Holy Spirit is moving. He continues to prepare the hearts of people in China. Every day, I have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ, even if it means I could go to prison. For who can have victory over God? Nobody, no matter what country. Good morning and welcome Uptown Community Church. Thanks so much for joining us. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want to say welcome as well too. My name is Roger. I'm the uh, teaching pastor here in Uptown Community Church. And we're going to continue on a series that we started off a few weeks ago. Um, just to kind of give you some context, this series emerged 
out of another series we did on world religions. And so we, as we were studying other religions and other belief systems, um, I kept coming back to this idea of these questions that would show up. And this morning's teaching is going to come out of the very first one we, we talked about because there's a question that's going to pop up about Christianity that you've probably encountered or you've probably encountered as an objection to faith. But let's just recap what we talked about last week. So last week, we, a- we asked the question, and hopefully answered as well too, do I have to go to church to be a Christian? You hear this all the time. We talk about how the pandemic has really reshaped Christianity and is going to continue to reshape Christianity, but not just Christianity, but our society in general. And again, depending on how you view it and your, your filters and how you uh, experience it, what people have been asking themselves is like, you know, Isn't church this archaic idea? Or do I even have to? Because isn't Christianity just simply me saying a sinner's prayer and and accepting Jesus into my heart? I actually, it's so funny to me how um, I'll teach on something or even previous to teaching on something, the Holy Spirit will kind of reveal some conversations to me or I'll have conversations with an individual. I had a conversation with somebody a few days back and uh, we were talking about church, of course, because I'm a pastor, and people will ask that question. And it's always interesting. So people will, um, will kind of saddle up to me and won't ask me a direct question, but they'll kind of go, you know, so, you know, so you're a pastor, eh? Like, yeah, like, so, uh, you know, what about, and so we'll have this conversation. And the particular conversation I had with this individual was about church. And they said to me, well, I, you know, I just, I can't go back to church. I said, oh, tell me why. And, of course, the church tradition they were coming out of was very much a, uh, well, it was a Catholic background. And, of course, uh, this individual was very much offended by um, the scandal of the priest. And, of course, we all know about that. And I had this conversation. And they said to me, yeah, you know, I don't need to go to church. I just want to be a good person. I said, oh, this is good. I like this. Let's have, let's continue this conversation. And we couldn't, but it's like, okay, I, I get it, right? So the question of do I have to be, do I have to go to church to be a Christian? It's a great question, but it really kind of reveals some assumptions. We talked about that last week, but really, and I gave the answer right at the very beginning. No, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian, but what type of Christian are you then? See, we don't ask this question. We don't ever say to ourselves, okay, I don't need to go to this. I don't have to go and do anything to be a Christian. But then, what kind of Christian are you exactly? And I I think the way I really wanted to kind of approach it was that, how do I place myself in the best position for maturity and growth? And I just want you to know something. You sitting at home watching a YouTube video or an online church service, while it was necessary for a, a brief period of time, it's not going to place you in the best position for growth and maturity. Why? Because growth and maturity happens in our discomfort, not in our comfort. Like wearing flannel pajamas and a T-shirt and watching some on television as you're, you know, drinking coffee or eating breakfast and or, you know, texting or surfing, you know, TikTok or whatever it might be. That's very comfortable. But just to be clear, you're not going to grow. Wait, 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 I'm, I'm not going to grow. Have you seen some of these TikTok videos? I have, and I, you know, the growth may not be the type we're looking for, but it's like, like, how do I actually grow? And again, your growth happens in your discomfort. And what I said about church is that church, properly understood, is a place of agitation. <laughs> you need to be annoyed, right? Your, your assumptions need to be challenged. Your filters need to be kind of maybe reframed. You have to have the opportunity of sitting next to somebody that you don't know but sees the world different than you. And this is kind of important, actually, because agitation is, is, is a catalyst for growth in every aspect of your life. So the catalyst for growth in my, uh, my, my, the area of my life for health was my diabetes. Uh, uh, when I was told I had diabetes a year and a half ago, that kind of awoken me to the, rea- the reality that I got to kind of get my stuff together or else this is the path that's open for me. So that was the agitation for me to kind of uh, refocus my life in a certain way in regards to health. But the fact is your faith left unchallenged, left unintended, left to your own devices, you're not going to grow. See, we always choose the path of least resistance. When's the last time you went to a restaurant and ordered something you've never tried before? doesn't happen that often. You may feel kind of experimental by eating something off somebody else's plate, but you don't really. Why? Because we just, we, we are creatures of habit, and that habit can be good or it can be bad. But either way, church is meant to be a place where you come and you go, oh, I didn't realize that. I love my small group. My small group wrapped up this week, and um, we had a, a feisty conversation. Um, and I, again, I 
like feisty conversations. But what's important to me, though, is that I get to see faith through uh, different perspectives and different filters. I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about God that way, or I didn't think about scriptures that way. That's interesting. But even in my other roles that I have in my life right now, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing people talk about faith, talking to people talking about God in different filters. I was like, oh, okay. I had another conversation with an individual who is looking for a church right now, and by looking, just thinking about it, not actually going anywhere and doing it about it, which is fine as well, too. But uh, they said, I said, so what are you looking for in a church? And it was funny, is people actually think that I'm going to invite them to my church, and I don't, because we may not be a good fit for them. And when he gave me the criteria, I'm like, oh, absolutely, I'm not inviting them to UCC, because they're not going to like what we do here. So it's like, oh, what's your criteria? And his criteria was based not upon scripture, not upon theology, not upon tradition, not upon any of that, but based upon some cultural things, as I, as I try to gently put it. I'm like, oh, okay, interesting, right? So when we think of ourselves, it's like, what is church meant to be? Do I need to go to church? And I said, I, I just want you to understand something. The agitation, the discomfort, the idea of kind of mixing with people who see the world differently, this is all part of our growth process. This is why the, I, the idea of attractional church or entertainment church is so antithetical to the gospel because it doesn't really hit you in a place that's going to push you out of your comfort zone. It's not going to push you out of a place of it's going to be saying, okay, this is what, how I need to actually grow in my faith. Uh, we look at that quote by Frederick Douglass where it says, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And I absolutely agree with that. And we wrapped up with two passages from uh, 2 Corinthians. First one says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, for Paul, the test for the church in Corinth is seen in the next passage of 2 Corinthians 3.18. The test is simply this, transformation. Are you actually growing? And I said to you last week that one of the ways we test to see if we're growing is just think of yourself last year at this point in time, right? Where have you grown in your faith? Now, if the answer is, I can't think of anything. Now, that might just be because sometimes we don't have a, a proper external perspective. Maybe you should have a conversation with somebody. I had a conversation with somebody very recently, and they said, oh, I don't think I've grown. I'm like, actually, you know what? I think you're wrong on that. I think you actually have grown, but I don't think you realize or you recognize where your growth is. And so it's this idea that Christianity has been framed and posed in many different ways, but the thing that I think is most missing about this idea of Christianity is that a lot of what we see with Christianity is really coming down to narcissism, right? This is the needs I have, or this is the way I want to approach things. But really what Christianity seen, again, in the first century in the early church was this idea of agitation, this idea of growth and being put in uncomfortable co positions so that from there you go and go, yeah, you know what? There's an area of my life I need to work on or I need to think about or I need to grow. So that's what we talked about last week. This morning we're going to, I'm going to try to answer a question that's a bit of a doozy. And uh, by doozy, I mean, uh, a question that can often stump other Christians on how to answer this. So the question is this, how can God condemn people who've never heard the gospel? So if you remember back when we did the World Religion series, the very first uh, um, uh, part of the series, we talked about this one part that can really bug people about Christianity, and that is the exclusivity. Right? People will say to you, well, isn't Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Bahahula, Angelina Jolie. Aren't they all just the same? Like, aren't they just all the same? Right? Like, isn't every religion just the same? It's, just, it's trying to describe a piece of God. And for Christians, if we're actually authentic, we get to kind of go, no. No, actually, we don't. It, it, it actually, it's not all created equal. To which the culture goes, oh, well, you are just narrow-minded. You are, like, like, there's a diversity of, of, and again, you know, you get the idea. So for Christians, this has been a very uncomfortable conversation for us because people, because then some will say to you, well, what about the person in the deepest, darkest, and I don't know why it's deep and dark. Can they not be on top of a mountain at least? I don't know why it has to always be deep. But what about the person at this far-flung part of the world 500 years ago who's never mentioned, who's never heard of Jesus? How is that person, is that person going to go to hell because they've never heard of Jesus? To which we as Christians kind of go, oh, that's a good point. I, I, I don't know. 
I don't know if we mumble like that, but that'd be kind of funny. Uh, actually, I think it'd be kind of a funny little thing we did if like, you, you start losing an argument. Well, what well, was that? No, no, I just, I, I just answered your question. You didn't hear it. So the point simply is this. What happens to people that have never heard the gospel? It's a great question. I'm going to attempt to answer it this morning in, in hopefully an authentic way. But first, before we get that, we need to talk about circumstantial evidence. Now, the reason we need to a- answer the question about circumstantial evidence is because in this particular question, the Bible doesn't directly answer this. It's kind of important to just at the very front, I want to tell you this really clearly. The Bible doesn't really answer this in a very concise way. So when we talk about circumstantial evidence, we say this. Circumstantial evidence relates to a series of facts other than the particular fact sought to be proved. The party offering circumstantial evidence argues that this series of facts, by reason and experience, is so closely associated with the fact to be proved that the fact to be proved may be inferred simply from the existence of the circumstantial evidence. And yes, I took this from a legal uh, definition of circumstantial evidence, but you get the idea. We don't have a video of this individual committing the crime. But we do have uh, this individual in the area around the time, oh, with blood splatter on their their clothing. Okay, that's circumstantial, but I'm going to put together the circumstantial evidence and I'm going to show you why this individual committed the crime that I'm trying to prove to you. We go, okay, fair enough. So, fact. No scripture clearly and concisely addresses this issue. Someone could say, well, what about, like, when I, whenever I try to teach on a topic like this, I want to be very clear about a couple of things. That because I don't want ever, I don't want to over, I don't want to oversimplify the Bible and say, well, you know, for God so loved the world. Well, does that really answer the question? No. Yes, he does. Ans- yes, he does love the world, but does that answer the question about the people who have never heard? Second, fact. The overall theme of Scripture and the character of God gives us plenty of evidence, circumstantial evidence, to answer this question. Okay? Now, when we talk about this idea of, of, of people who have never heard the gospel, what we're really asking ourselves is a question of guilt and innocence. And yes, I got these from a legal uh, website as well, too. When we talk about guilt, there's a few factors when we uh, have this idea of guilt. A. A person who is guilty is responsible or, uh, for a reprehensible act. They're culpable. B, found to have violated a criminal law by a jury or a judge. C, d- uh, deserving blame as for an error. So we'd say that when we use the word guilty, these factors kind of play into it. Now, for innocence, on the other side, this is what it looks like. Not guilty of a specific crime or offense, legally blameless. Within, allowed by, or sanctioned by the law or lawful, or not corrupted or tainted with evil or unpleasant emotional emotion, sinless, pure. Now, it's funny, if you look at legal, de- uh, legal definitions of things, if you go back fur- further enough, sin is actually used as a legal term. It's kind of interesting, actually, but we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. So now let me give you the answer at the very beginning, and then we're going to unpack it, okay? Because, again, the answer can be a little bit simplistic, but I need you to understand wh- uh, how I'm going to answer this. So, the answer in two parts. Part one, God will not send the innocent to hell. Two, there is no one innocent. Oh, all right. Don't you love when people give you an answer? They're like, that's not really an answer. Okay, bear with me. But I need you to understand the framework by which I'm going to be approaching this. So, when someone says to me, well, what happens to somebody who's never heard the gospel? The inference is, well, that person's never had the chance. So, therefore... They're innocent, and therefore, they should go to heaven. It seems like a logical argument. Unfortunately, the argument is deeply, deeply flawed. And we'll unpack that in a second. So the argument is always like, and again, the world loves to use this. Next week, we're going to really dive down into this particular argument. But the argument goes something like this. Well, I'm a good person. Well, how do you know you're a good person? I haven't killed anybody. Fantastic. Fantastic. But that's not the level of goodness that we're looking at here. Because again, go back to the definition of a guilt. Go back to the definition of innocence. If you're innocent, you're innocent of everything. But if you're guilty of one thing, you're guilty of everything. So it's like this. You can, you can uh, say to somebody, well, you know what? You killed this individual, so you are guilty. 
Oh, by the way, I also ran a red light. Well, it doesn't matter. You're guilty of one thing. You're guilty of everything. Like, we don't have to add on more things to, you know, we just know you're guilty. So when we think of this idea of guilt and innocence, what we really do have to do is to, we have to define it. Because when the world defines it, they define it in such a way that everybody is innocent, which is kind of convenient if you think about it. But as far as legal terms go, it doesn't really work. You don't get to say to a jury, you don't get to say to culture, hey, I'm, I'm innocent, because nobody really is. So let's unpack this, and let's, I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to unpack part two first, and then I'm going to come back to part one, because part one's kind of, well, I don't want to say easy, but it's a little bit easier. But we're going to unpack part two, because this will take a little bit more time, because we need to go through a, a, a few things. So part two, first we need to understand uh, uh, this idea of God. When we think of God, um, I always find it fascinating that for people when I ask them, give me a definition of what God is for you. He's a life force. He's, all, he's this, he's that, he's energy, he's all that, right? It feels like God's more of a nuclear reactor than he is a person, but that's, uh, that's a whole different conversation, right? One of the things we need to understand about how the Bible, and what's interesting about this, and of course because you're a UCC, um, there's a very Jewish understanding of who God is. Um, Again, I don't, I don't know if this is like a bingo card for UCC, but a rabbinic commentator once said, um, chaos is the opposite of the nature of God. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting if you think about it. So when God creates harmony, when he creates the universe, he creates it with laws. Now, that's kind of interesting if you think about it, because C.S. Lewis asked the question, why laws? Why not lawlessness? Why does there have to be laws? Why does the universe operate in such a fine-tuned way, right? Why doesn't things just haphazardly happen? And you may say, say to yourself, well, they do. No, they actually don't, right? There are fine-tuned laws in the world. And this is all part of God's justice. When we look through the Bible, and again, especially the Old Testament, what we see is the writers uh, of these uh, books have this idea about God, and, and the idea is this. Whatever we think about justice, whatever we think about truth, this is Yahweh. This is God. Now, I was going to go down a rabbit, pa uh, rabbit hole on this one, uh, and you're welcome that I didn't, but I was going to show you something, and this is actually a kind of a fascinating argument. When, when I say to people that God is just, they're like, oh, no, 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 that's because how you define it. I said, oh, interesting fact. Let's take a look at how other religions understand justice. And let me ask you a question. When people flee violence and chaos, where do they go? Well, they don't go to these countries that have this religious foundation. They don't go to these atheistic countries. Where do they go? They go to countries that have a Judeo-Christian understanding of, of justice. Now, why do you think that might be? It's an uncomfortable conversation for other people, but I, I love it. Because what I'm forcing them to say is, why do you think people go to these countries? Right? If, if you are somebody who has just been ejected from your country for uh, reasons of war or famine. And again, there are so many reasons why. And we see this every day on the news. Where do you go? Where do you go? And understand something. You don't just go to the country next to you, because that would be more convenient and save you a lot of you know, smuggling and paying for people to get you to places and all that kind of stuff. If you could go somewhere like next to you, go, yeah. You know, if you lived in Waterloo and you were experiencing, you know, war-torn strife in Waterloo, well, going to Kitchener, that would be the easiest one, right? But what you wouldn't want to do is go to Calgary. Well, probably because it's too cold there anyways, but you get the idea, right? You don't want to go so far away that you have to travel so much distance. Why is it that refugees always seem to go to countries that have a Judeo-Christian underpinning? Because the idea of Judeo-Christian is an understanding of justice. Now, if I can simplify, and I mean grossly simplify, the justice system for a Judeo-Christian understanding of it, and again, back when it was kind of first conceived, there's two concepts to the, the justice within a Judeo-Christian understanding. One, personal freedom. Two, personal accountability. Now, how do these kind of put together? The, the how are these are put together is simple. On the one hand, every individual is made in the image of God, and Every individual has to choose how to live that out. But on the other hand, you're also held accountable to how you let play that out. So, for example, if you want to worship a different god or if you want to work in this, this particular job, fantastic. But if you want to oppress somebody else or if you want to hurt, harm, or hinder somebody else, well, 
we have some laws in place for that. Now, you can say to yourself, well, it's not perfect. Of course not. It, there's nothing that's perfect. But in regards to everything else that's out there, hmm, it's not bad. So a Judeo-Christian understanding of justice is directly linked to who and how we understand God. So the first thing you need to understand about God is that God is just. Now, why is that important? Because if God is just, then this has to play out in a different kind of way. So there's something called general revelation. For those of you who are, it's okay, the cup's empty. Um, for those of you who understand anything about uh, theology, you understand that general revelation is this idea that God has revealed himself to the world in a particular way. Now, the revelation of God, this is a definition, the revelation of God that is available to all humanity, not expressed in words, non-propositional or specific actions, but in creation, conscience, and history. Now, I will say this about evangelicals. I will say this about Protestants. We... We tend to take a look at general revelation. We kind of look down on it a little bit. We kind of say, well, you know. But the fact is general revelation has been in play around the world for millennia. In general revelation, these are different what we call apologetic arguments. So for some of you who have been part of uh, the Wednesday night small group, you know, uh, what you'll know is that Randy loves apologetics. And in apologetics, these are various types of arguments you may have heard of or may have been brought up. And these are wonderful ways to talk about God. And again, you have to approach it not from a, oh, you believe in Jesus, let's have a conversation. Culture and society is so far past that now that you have to find a common point to start off with and then go from there. Right? So again, each one of these arguments, cosmological argument, cause and effect, teleological argument, order, intelligent design, anthropological argument, humanity reflects deity, moral argument, common morality, ontological argument, God's definition requires existence. These are all different types of arguments that are apologetic, but they all fall under general revelation. Now, why is this important? Because in general revelation, according to scripture, God kind of speaks about who he is. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now, pause for a second. What's interesting is, is that up to about 50 years ago, maybe you can say postmodernism, and I'll let you decide whenever that starts. Some would say late 1960s, some would say perhaps maybe early 1980s. It's, it's a range, right? Nobody can g quite agree when this next movement of thinking started. But prior to that, there was this understood way of under looking at the world and going, you know what? It's interesting to me, it's interesting to historians that when you look around the world, historically, people's groups that we encounter, there's a lot of similarities, eerily so. And so what this tells us and what the Bible tells us is that God, through nature, through general revelation, has been communicating with humanity whether they know Jesus or not. And this is globally. The psalmist is the same thing. The heavens declare the glory of the God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Now, what's this saying? This is telling us that general revelation is one way that God uses to speak to humanity throughout history. I, I love this uh, quote by Helen Keller. When Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, learned to communicate with the outside world, her teacher, started sh her teacher shared with her about God. Helen said that she had always knew he was there. She just didn't know his name. I find that interesting. And again, just as because as Helen Keller is somewhat known in our world today, I think that's kind of interesting that a person who has no experience with the world as far as uh, 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 sight and or hearing, but there's this understanding that there's something more. Now, in general revelation, we also have this, this uncomfortable truth, and this is the uncomfortable truth, is that we have this idea about what God requires. And again, this is taught to us through the Bible. Okay? Romans chapter 2, once again, 
Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciousness also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, at other times even defending them. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to end. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says this. He has given them, he has given human beings an awareness of eternity. Now, why is this important? When the Jewish people were trying to talk about this idea of who Yahweh was, especially to the Canaanite cultures around them, one of the things you'll find that's interesting when you study other world religions, Canaanite religions, Greek religions, um, gods have a beginning point. And they also have an ending point. Gods can die. Which is kind of interesting if you think about it. It's like, I don't know how, how to even describe it, but their idea of, of God was it very much a human understanding that as, as human beings have a beginning, as human beings have an end, their deities also had a beginning, but their deities also had an end. But when the Jewish people started talking about Yahweh, they said, no, no, he is ever existent. He is eternal. Now, I just wanted to just pause for a second and tell you something. The idea of eternality was very much a... Um, a controversial piece of who God is. Because if I say to you that God has always existed, you kind of get a bit of a headache thinking about that. You say to yourself, wait, what? Yeah, he's always existed. Okay, I need some Tylenol. Uh, how does that even work, right? How does that even, like, and again, for our finite creatures, thinking of something infinite is completely opposite to us. And I had this really interesting conversation with an atheist. I love talking to atheists. I don't know why. I just do. Um, they say the darndest things. Uh, we should have a show like that called Atheists Say the Darndest Things. But this atheist said to me, well, you know, God is just a, uh, a culmination of, 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 um, of evolutionary psychology. I said, oh, that's interesting. So let me ask you this. If we take that line of thought, then how does something that, that sees uh, uh, birth and death consistently, how does that thing then see something that's outside of that? And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, it's a philosophical argument that if something is born and something dies, and early human beings, however you want to how, wha how view that, however far back you want to go on the evolutionary path, how does that being all of a sudden say, well, by the way, there's something more that precedes birth and then precedes death, uh, or, or not precedes death, but exists after death. What is, how does that take place? And it's always kind of, I don't want to say comical, but I also think it's kind of funny for them to kind of go, well, ah, well ah. it's like, okay, just, just admit it. It's a weird concept for something that's finite to have, right? And that's actually kind of interesting about that. So when the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says that God has placed an awareness of, e the, of, of eternal, um, e eternity in us, it's kind of an interesting statement. And I just, like, you've heard that verse before, but I need you to understand that's actually kind of an interesting way of thinking about how the world works because previous to that, the other religions didn't have that. Now, we've talked about God's justice. We've talked about kind of how God reveals himself, but you need to understand something, that there is also a judgment within this. So again, let's go back to Romans. So the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. I love how John Stott uh, talks about this idea of wrath. The wrath of God is his steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil and on its forms and manifestations. He goes on to say this, when we displace God's angers towards sin, what are we asking God to do? What are we asking him to overlook? Are we forgetting that sin is a cause of every form of brokenness on this planet and that in every sin there is a victim that cries out for justice? So why I think this is important is because right now our culture is trying to redefine uh, a lot of things. But one of the things they're trying to redefine is accountability. And what they're trying to say is something that kind of goes like this. Well, this person, uh, we should be free to live out, or we should be free to express, or we should be free. And again, uh, just to be clear, remember human freedom, human accountability? Absolutely. Have at it. I, like when people say to me certain things about, like, you know, this is what I am and this is what I th believe, I'm like, yeah, great. And they're always kind of shocked as a pastor how I'm not trying to beat them down somehow. I'm not. Why? Because, again, it's not my place 
to say to them, oh, by the way, because if, you don't, you know, if you don't accept the Bible, if you don't accept this framework of how reality exists, then why am I going to tell you your framework is wrong? Now, if you want to have a conversation of the difference between your framework and mine, that's a different way of approaching it. Right? And this is how, sometimes how Christians kind of miss this point. When someone says to you, this is what I am or this is what I believe, it's not an invitation for us to tell them why they're wrong. What it is, though, is just an awareness of, oh, okay, that's fine. But at some point in time, if the person invites you into this conversation, well, that's different. So as you know, I've, 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 I've taken on two different roles in my life, and I'm starting to get to some, some people. And in that role, you know, I, right up front, I tell them, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor. But I haven't then you know, told them why they're going to hell, which I know is something kind of remarkable, right? But what I am trying to do is I'm trying to convey who I am so that they may build trust, but also realize as well, too, that I'm not there to kind of condemn them. But what's interesting is now, over the last month or so, there's some interesting kind of conversations now that I've kind of established my bona fides, if, if you want to use that phrase, right? I've established who I am as a person. So now they're asking me some interesting questions. Again, the question about, like, oh, you know, uh, what type of church or, or how do you view God? These are interesting questions. And I'm, 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 I actually invite them, but I invite them in a way that allows the person to understand that I'm not trying to tell them that they're wrong. But I will tell them that they're wrong, but not in, a certain, not in a way that's like, oh, yeah, you're wrong. But just like, hey, this is kind of how I see the world. This is the framework that I see the world. So what John's not saying is kind of important is that when we talk about this idea of the wrath of God, the anger of God, the justice of God, it is not about this idea. Like when we think about some of the horrible things that happen in the world, human trafficking, for example, so a little interesting um, uh, fun fact for you, and I'm, by fun I mean horrifying, is Waterloo Region right now is experiencing an uptick in human trafficking. So at the Rave Hope, where I work as well too as staff, we have, um, we have uh, a police coming to us, I would say almost a weekly basis now, with uh, pictures of, of, of young girls who have gone missing, who have perhaps been seen in this area, maybe perhaps around the 10th city area part of, you know, Victoria and Weaver there, or, or, or have gone missing. And just so you know, the implications of this is that this individual may be, uh, it could be volunteer or not, we, we don't know. So the question I always say to somebody is if everyone's free to live how, however they want, if everyone's free to choose that, how do we address this? So what's interesting is the world has said, well, these things are absolutely wrong, and these things are kind of negotiable. Well, these negotiable ones kind of lead to this other stuff as well, too. So when do you kind of draw the line? So when we talk about this idea of God's judgment, people are like, oh, yeah, there you go. Christians talking about God's uh, judgment and, and their anger. I'm like, well, shouldn't we get angry about some things? Should we not get angry um, about, like, how we treat? So right now uh, it's Earth Day, Earth Month, or uh, it, it was Earth Day, and so... Uh, what's interesting is I was listening to this uh, podcast, I know, famous words for me, and uh, this guy who wrote this book called Cobalt Red. By the way, read this book. It's about the cobalt industry and how 75% of the world's cobalt comes from the Congo. And that a particular government owns the rights to all this uh, cobalt. It's a rare earth mineral. It's, just so you know, cobalt is essential for EV or batteries. It's like it, you, you cannot, right? And so right now, everybody, every country in the world is saying, hey, by so-and-so, we're not going to have any more gas-burning cars. And I was like, yes, way to go. But the underside of that is that a lot of these vehicles that are electric, well, they need rare earth minerals. And the people who control these rare earth minerals are not nice individuals. So this guy who uh, used to work for the United Nations, uh, he, his entire uh, uh, career was based upon like uh, like – like looking at atrocities around the world. Well, have someone alerted him to what's going on in the Congo. So these individuals in the Congo are mining cobalt with like children on their back, these me women, children, and, and again, gangs are forcing people into this because this is a very, very, very important mineral. Now, why I'm saying this to you is because what I find interesting is that we, we can talk about one thing, and, oh, we, we want to be environmentally friendly, and we absolutely do, w whichever we are, because why? The environment is part of God's creation. And as Christ followers, we are meant to be caretakers of that. That's important. But we can't pat ourselves on the back for your electric cars, but then not be aware of kind of how some of this stuff is being taken place. And so he wrote this book called Cobalt Red. And again, it, just, it was just horrifying to me how 
the majority of the world's technology companies gets their cobalt from these places. It's like, oh, okay. So what I want to say to you, and, the, and again, a little bit of a tangent there, but that when we talk about justice as a Christ follower, we have to realize it's not just about sin in the sense of like, oh, you've done this bad. But sin is about, you know, it, it, it has a, a broader perspective. Because a lot of what the Bible talks about talks about not just simply about what sin as far as relational or and all that type of goes. And again, Christians kind of get hung up on some of this stuff. But we have to realize that how corporations, how governments, how organizations, how people treat one another in regards to equality and, and again, um, just, just the human condition, this is a part of it as well. And God's not okay. Just be clear. God's not okay with, with human trafficking. God's not okay with, with how, you know, uh, cobalt being mined and how women and children are, are, are exposing themselves to horrific, horrific conditions doing this just so that we can feel good about ourselves on the other end of it. Just to be clear, right? God's justice goes across the board. It's not just particularly about the things you don't like. So when we talk about this guy, this idea of God's justice, people kind of go, well, of course you Christians go that way. But I just want people to know, when, when the world talks about justice, I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to kind of, how do I say this in a nice way? I don't mean to be, uh, I don't mean to downplay it, but I do mean to say to them, they don't go far enough. They just don't go far enough. Because what we are is part of who we are on the inside, and that's where the Bible really has a more interesting conversation. Now, there's a guy named Emile Durkheim. If any of you study sociology, Emile Durkheim is considered the father of sociology. Now, just a fun fact about Emile Durkheim, he's not a Christ follower. He would actually consider himself an atheist. But Emile Durkheim wrote this book called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. Because Emile Durkheim, oh, I put the comma in the wrong spot there. Apologies. That's going to bother me now. Um, the Elementary Forms of Religious Life, comma, Emile Durkheim. Sorry, that's, that's going to really bother me. Um, I'll try not to be too distracted. Emile Durkheim, he studies cultures around the world, and he realized something. And bam, this book came out in 1912. He goes, you know what's interesting? is when we study all these three, uh, when we study the cultures around the world, whether in present day, 1912, and or historically, well, it's kind of weird how they all have a c some commonalities. And these are the three commonalities he came up with. So three commonalities of the people's groups. First, all these people groups have something that's sacred. And this, is it, this is how he defines the sacred. The ideas that cannot be properly explained inspire awe and considered worthy of spiritual aspect of devotion. The second thing he says is that they all have beliefs and practices which create highly emotional state, collective effervescence, I love that word, and invest symbols with sacred importance. Third, he says there's also what's called the moral community, a group of people sharing a common moral philosophy. And this is, again, a direct quote from Emil Durkheim's book. Man's characteristic privileges is that bond he accepts is not physical but moral, that is, social. He is governed not by a material environment brutally imposed on him, by a co but by a conscious superior to his own. The superior of which he feels because a greater part of his existence transcends the body, he escapes the body's yoke. Now, what's he saying? What's kind of fascinating is Emile Durkheim talks about this, but then he says, well, it's, 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 it's humanity's collective conscience. Just so you know, uh, humanity's collective conscience is basically a cesspool. We don't have it. Right? I, I know this is, sounds kind of horrifying to you, but when I look at people, I just I, I, I don't tend to see a group of people who are trying to do the best for everyone. We say that, but we live out really for ourselves. Emile Durkheim recognized this when he first puts it together. Now, why this is important is, it makes me cry too, just to be clear. Right? But why this is important and why this is necessary is this. Emile Durkheim, who is not a Christ follower, recognizes that all the people groups throughout history well, why do they even believe in the sacred? Where is this transcendent belief coming from? And that's kind of interesting. It's something we call what's, ca uh, uh, what, what's called an anthropological constant. The anthropological constant is this. Every people group that we've ever encountered have religion. Now, why is that? Right? Because, again, evolutionary psychology tells us that that should not be the case. Or it might be the case a couple of times, but why is it people groups who have never met each other, have never encountered each other, 
and have you know, been displaced by maybe hundreds if not thousands of years, might be on different continents, why do they always seem to have religion? And again, Emil Durkheim breaks it down into three ways. And I would say to you that those three ways are kind of important because uh, they should be eerily familiar to you because Emil Durkheim could have maybe in a very uh, rudimentary way to find the church. We have the sacred, we have beliefs and practices, and we have a moral community. So now let's take a look at what the truths are in general revelation because we need to get, we're going to answer the, uh, the first part of this. This is all going to be part of this, right? So have you ever gone camping somewhere and you're far enough away from the city and you're, you stand up and you look at the night sky? What's amazing to me is when we look at the night sky in the city, we don't realize how many stars there actually are. But if you've ever been camping and you've been away from the city, away from light pollution, and you looked up in the sky at night, there is something that kind of overwhelms you, isn't there? You look at the night sky, and you can actually almost make out the Milky Way as well, too. There's a smallness that you feel. That's by design. But there's something else that speaks to you as well, that there is, that this reality that we see, that there seems to be something more. Now, the reason I use the more is because it's, it's cheating to call it God. I'm not going to cheat. So when we talk about this idea of general revelation, the first thing we understand is that there is more to this world. Every people group in the world realizes this. Now, I know that within the postmodernism, uh, post-enlightenment, we have now somehow fooled ourselves into believing that there is no more more. But the fact is we still believe the more. We just have now manifested in different ways. Second thing, and that more is above creation. When you look at creation, you don't go, wow, it's incredible how these all just randomly fit together. You don't think that. You think of like, there is some hand behind this design. There is something behind this that has put this all together because it's just too beautiful and it's just too perfect. And you're absolutely correct on both counts. Third, that Moore has written his law upon the hearts and minds of his creation. Now, remember I said to you that Emil Durkheim discovered something? He wasn't the first. And he's not the last. But all people groups around the world throughout history have always believed that there is something more to this world. And in this more, they have created intricate, intricate religious systems to try to quantify, to try to think of this more. Now, why is this important? Because as the Bible tells us, that everybody realizes something. That when we hurt, when we harm ourselves, or someone else, we feel it internally. We feel it internally. When relationships are broken, when our harmony with the environment is broken, we feel it internally. And so what happens is, is that law that's written upon us, all of a sudden we realize that there is this debt. And I use the word debt intentionally because that's how it feels. Right? When you've got an argument with somebody and you know you're in the wrong, there's a part of you that kind of goes, oh, man, okay, how am I going to make this right? right? Now, a mature person would go to the person and apologize. An immature person would say, well, I'm going to do something nice for somebody else. But either way, you are feeling this debt inside of you, <clears throat> and therefore, you are trying to somehow alleviate the need for a debt. That, by its very nature, is religious life. It's understanding that there's something that's sacred, something that's beyond this more, and therefore these laws are now applicable to us. And finally, we must appeal to the more and follow his laws and seek forgiveness, his forgiveness for our violations. And again, yes, I'm revealing my, my own biases there, but you get the idea. Every people group throughout history has, has a complex idea of religion, but that religion is always kind of interesting because it's not just a religion. It's like, oh, yes, there is a God out there. Woo, yay, God. It's that God's mad. How do I make that God not mad? Oh, I know. Let's throw a virgin in a volcano. I know. Let's cut the hearts out of people and, and burn these hearts to our God. Horrific, yes. But what do all these things have in common? There is something that we have offended that we have to make right. That is the very primary understanding of what Emil Durkheim realizes, but also is revealed to us in general revelation. Now, Here's humanity's problem. 
and again, you are kind of know we're ending up here. We never get it right. We just don't get it right. It's so funny to me how, you know, people think that the more civilized we are as a society, we'll just treat each other better. Have you gotten that sense out there lately? My guess is probably not. Right? Like, like we are as primitive as we've ever been. It doesn't matter where technology has taken us. It doesn't matter where science has taken us. We are still very primitive in how we feel. I use the word primitive because, again, you know, according to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, we were supposed to be, as the more civilized we are, the, more be the better we treat one another. And that's just kind of a lie we tell ourselves because we don't actually do so. So humanity's problem, again, through scripture, is that we have, we, we, we just are, <laughs> we are just not doing it right. But again, if I talk to somebody who comes from a different religious background, or no religious background, I say, well, what do you do to alleviate that problem? Well, I, I think good thoughts. I try to be a good person. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a scratch you just cannot itch in that way. There's this, that you're, you're still going to be haunted by this idea of like, okay, what does this actually mean? There's a great book, a book I recommend, a book I left in my bag at the top there because I have it. Uh, it's called Eternity in Our Hearts by a guy named Don Richardson. I recommend everyone, if you can, read this book. Now, fun fact, a number of years ago, uh, the, uh, the uh, publishing company that released this book has now released it for free by, by a PDF. So if you type in Eternity in Our Hearts, Don Richardson, PDF, boop, it will pop up for you. So you can read it for free. Okay. Now, why is this book so important? This book, I read this number of years ago, changed how I understood this topic. Had I not read this book, I would have thought differently about this particular topic. But this is what Don Richardson said. Eternity in their hearts is my attempt to trace through history some examples of this beautiful interaction between the Melchizedek factor, God's general revelation, and the Abraham factor, God's special revelation. Let me unpack what he's talking about. In his book, what he does is he shows people groups throughout history, ones you've heard of, how God, through general revelation, has revealed himself to them. And you're like, wait, what? And he shows this throughout his book. He has meticulously researched these different people groups. And this is not just like, and, and by the way, yes, lots of footnotes. Right? This is not like, hey, you know, wouldn't this be a great idea if God did this? He shows, again, through the people's groups and, 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 and all that. Now, what he means by Melchizedek factor is, you know, in the book of Genesis, this guy named Melchizedek shows up. This guy has freaked a lot of people out because we don't really know how to classify them. Some people have said, well, this is Jesus, this is God. And, and again, all these things could be correct, but we don't really have a, a really understanding of it. But the reason why Melchizedek is so important is because Melchizedek creates this kind of covenantal relationship with Abram. And, it, and again, when you look at this relationship and how, how uh, Don Richardson kind of breaks down, you're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But he says, though, is that this is, this is a kind of an example of God's general revelation but Abraham is a very specific revelation. Now, this is what Don Richardson go on to, goes on to say. He says this, question. If God gave two pagan peoples, Canaanites and Greeks, and he shows this, prior witness of his existence, could he not have also extended the same or at least a similar providence to other pagan peoples as well? Perhaps even to all of them? In other words, has the God who prepared the gospel for all peoples also prepared all peoples for the gospel? If he has, then the current assumption held by millions of believers and non-believers alike that pagan people cannot understand and generally do not want to receive the Christian gospel, and that is therefore unfair and almost more work than it's worth to try to get them to accept it, must be a false assumption. His book is remarkable in how much research, and I can't believe nobody had wrote in his book beforehand. So what he is saying is kind of interesting. He's saying that basically that God through general revelation has revealed himself to people's groups. Now, why would he do that? Remember we started off this conversation? I know it seems like a, a lifetime ago now. At, at the first assumption we have to make about God, God is just. If God is just, then throughout the, 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 the wheel turning of history, there are groups of people who will never have encountered a Jewish person for Yahweh or a Christian person. And so the question we had to answer at the very beginning of this, well, what happens to them? Well, according to Don Richardson's research, is that God has spoken to these people. Not in a Mormon, oh, Jesus appeared to the, uh, in the Latin America type of a way. 
but as in the general revelation type of way. And he kind of documents this and kind of shows a little bit what this is all about. But it's interesting, though. In the book of Acts, we still ha we have an example of this as well, too. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman officer named Cornelius. He was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Pause. This is an individual who hasn't heard about Yahweh, hasn't heard about Jesus. But something inside of him says there is more. And what's interesting about Cornelius is he didn't adopt the Roman religions. Hmm. Why would that be? Why is it that Cornelius seems to understand what you know, others of his Roman uh, soldiers perhaps b did not know? That these representations of religion did not seem to kind of quantify what he knew to be true. Verse 3 says this. One afternoon about 3 o'clock. Remember we know about 3 o'clock? What's important about 3 o'clock? The time of prayer for Jewish people. This is why the, uh, the writer puts this here. Now, I'm not saying that God does miracles at 3 o'clock. But I am saying God did a miracle at 3 o'clock here. So I don't know. Well, you know, you tell me. One afternoon about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming towards him. Right? And, of course, we know the rest of the story. Cornelius answers this when Peter comes to Cornelius. Remember, right before this, though, Peter has a vision himself about the unclean animals. Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now, just, I just want to unpack this for a second here, okay? What's interesting is, is that God has, by his spirit, he has gone out to every human being on the planet and conveyed some sense of who he is to them. Now, why is this important? Because if somebody stands before God and that person says, well, I never heard about Jesus. I never heard about Yahweh. Is it fair that you now determine my eternal place because I never encountered uh, these two pe uh, people group, whether it's Jewish and or Christian? And I would say to you that you would, you would say that that would be a very unjust thing unless you realized that God has, as the Bible has said, he has conveyed who he is to people groups. And that's the part we need to understand. Now, Let's go back to part one. In Luke, Luke records this story. Now, it's not a parable, and I'll explain to you why in a second. Right? So you know the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, right? Now, the reason why this is not a parable, and it's, how it's a mistake when people say this is a parable, because this story has something that no other parable has. What is it? There's a person that's known, Lazarus. In every parable that Jesus says, he starts off like this. There's a Samaritan, there's a farmer, there's a gardener. You get the idea. He uses very specific generic terms. In Luke's gospel, he says, now Lazarus, this is the only time Jesus conveys a person's name in the story, which tells us this is different. I would say to you, I would argue quite nicely, that this is actually Jesus recounting something for his Jewish people because he's trying to tell them something. Okay? Now, you know the story of Lazarus, right? Luke chapter 16, verse 23 to 24. In Hades, where he's in torment, the rich man, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Now, pause for a second. I've mentioned this before, but I think this bears reminding. If you are in hell and you see a resort, with water, with food, and Abraham. I don't know, Abraham Grizzard, I don't know. What would, you, what would you, your first question be? Can I join you guys? Can I come out of hell into the, into the resort? That's what a normal person would do. That's what, every time I read the story, I kind of chuckle a little bit. Because if I'm in agony and somebody is not, well, I want to go where they are. You all feel this when you look on Instagram. Hey, they're having a party. I wish I was there. How come my friends didn't invite me? I wanted to go. You have the sense of like, well, they're having a better place. I'm going to go there. Why doesn't the rich man 
ask to go to, the, to where Abraham is. I'm going to tell you why. Because a rich man knows that he is supposed to be where he is. Now, I need you to understand something here. When we think about this idea of hell, we have this idea, and the, and, and the idea that I had in my mind of hell was God with this lever, right, this trap door. There's an X on the floor. When you come to heaven, you stand on the X, and you sit there and you wait, right? And then on the screen, your life plays. And I was always horrified by this because I didn't want people to see my life, right? It's a big DVD screen or whatever, and all your friends and family are watching it, and you're like, oh, this is uncomfortable. And at the end of it, God goes, hmm, nope. And this trap door opens, and boosh, right? You, get, you, 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 you fall, like, no, right? See, that would be the case except for the one reality. If God is just, when you stand before God, no one needs to tell you what's going to happen next. You know. Why? Why does Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Because before God's presence, the absolute, unvarnished truth is now exposed. And the truth is this. The rich man knows he's in hell, and he knows he deserves to be there. This is why he doesn't say to Lazarus, hey, can I come over there? Turn me a line. I I I'll come to where you are. But what does he do? What does he say? Hey, send Lazarus to me with some water. And not just water, just dip his finger for some moisture. It's kind of gross. I don't want to suck on someone's finger, right? But that's what he says. To cool my tongue, just send Lazarus to me. Why? Because everybody in hell wants to invite people to join them in their misery. Now, let's go on because it's not, this, it's not ending there. Verse 27 to 31 says this. He answered, then I beg you, Father, because Laz Abraham goes, nah. -uh. So he, then, he then, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have, this is important, Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Which is kind of funny because Jesus comes back from the dead. Be like, nah, I don't think so. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. You kind of get the, the kind of the, 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 the joke there, right? Lazarus comes back from the dead. Let's kill him. Let's kill Jesus now. Jesus comes back from the dead. Nah, I don't think so. So he's right. This is not just an abstract idea. This is actually truth. If someone comes back from the dead, ah, you know, not so much. Now, why does he use a phrase, Moses and the prophets? No surprise, this is a very Jewish phrase. What does this mean? Well, I'll tell you. For the Jewish people, Moses represents the law. The, the Tanakh is anchored by the Pentateuch. The Tanakh is the Old Testament, as we would call it. The Pentateuch are the first five books of the Old Testament. These are, 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 these are attributed to Moses. In the Pentateuch, the law of God is given to them. Right? What is the law of God? Well, the book of Deuteronomy tells us. Leviticus tells us. This, these are what the requirements of God. So the first part of this is the law. What does general revelation tell us? The law of God is clearly seen. We know. Right? I don't have to tell you. You know. But the second thing is interesting is the prophets. What do the prophets represent? What was the story of the prophets? So my small group, we went through the minor prophets. And one of the things we kind of understood is that what the prophets do is they stand before the people and go, this is where you've messed up. This is where you've messed up. This is the choices that you have made. Now, please understand something very clearly here. I do not subscribe to the branch of theology where you have no choice. I do not subscribe to the branch of theology where it says, God has decided for you and that no matter what you do, you know, it's just, it's just, it's over. I do not subscribe to that. But I will say to you as well, too, Jewish people don't subscribe to that either. When you look at the Old Testament, a phrase pops up all the time. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If God is God, choose him. Now, why would the Jewish people say that? Why would the prophets say that? Because they seem to believe, as Jesus does in John chapter 7, there might be a choice involved here. Right? The prophets are all about relationship. One of the things we said in my small group on Thursday, I said the prophets are all about love. Because how do they frame the relationship between us and God? Marriage, adultery, those are very intimate terms. Why do they use that language? 
because that's how they see the broken relationship between, between us and God. So the, the law of Moses says there's a choice, general revelation. This is what we know to be true. But what do the prophets say? In this law, you have a choice. You get to choose. You have the opportunity to choose how you want to go from there. C.S. Lewis and the Great Divorce. By the way, The Great Divorce is a fantastic book because it's a really interesting way of describing it, right? So in The, in the Great Divorce, what C.S. Lewis does, as C.S. Lewis does, C.S. Lewis does so great, is he has this idea of a busload of people coming from hell. And they're going to tour the outside of heaven. And people from heaven are going to come out and have a conversation with people from hell. And what the people from heaven are going to try to do is convince the people from hell, hey, come to heaven. And what C.S. Lewis does by the different conversations is the people from hell go, no, no I don't think so. I, I don't think so. What's funny is that there's one guy, that one conversation that's there is a priest, a pastor who's in hell. I have no problem believing that, just to be clear. But the pastor goes, well, you know what? I'd come to heaven, but we have this really great discussion group about the abstraction of, of the law and, and how heaven may not be real and all that. They're like, no, no, it's, heaven's right over there. Just come over there. They're like, no, we're, I, I don't, I don't want to miss out on, miss out on this, these deep conversations we're having about the impracticality of the theology of the transcendent. Blah, 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 blah. Right? It's like, oh, okay. So C.S. Lewis says this way in The Great Divorce. Hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others. I love that, by the way. Like that, like that might be our culture today. But you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself, wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can no longer, then there will be you, no you left to criticize a mood or even to enjoy it, but just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. See, what I think is so fascinating is when people say, well, you know, God's going to send people to hell. God doesn't send us anywhere, right? So th one author put it this way. When we are on earth, right, God says to us, my will be done. When we get to heaven, God says to us, thy will be done. Because on earth, we have the choice. We either get to choose the kingdom of heaven or our own kingdom. We get to either live for ourselves or we live with the cross. And we stand before God Decisions made. There's no lever. There's no X. It's just we stand before God, and the absolute utter truth of who we are and what we are is exposed before us. And we don't even need to have a conversation because we know. Now, let me close. Revelation chapter 7. This is a beautiful picture, and I love this picture. The writer of Revelation, the, the Apostle John, again, remember, the apostles used their language intentionally. Okay? Look what it says in Revelation chapter 7. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, what pops up for me in this one here is, is the highlighted words. Every nation, tribe, people, and language. Now, you're, you're saying to me, well, how is that possible? My response to you is, I don't know. But I do know this, that God's presence, God's spirit, is in this world right now at work. He has been in this world since Christ. He's been in the world previous to that as well, too. God's presence has gone out. And every person who stands before God, they will know the moment where the spirit tapped them on the shoulder and gave them a choice. And if necessary, here's the game tape. Click. But the interesting thing, though, it's not just a one and done. I, I don't know about you, but the Spirit taps me on the shoulder almost on a daily basis and saying, okay, who are you living for today? <laughs> Man, it's so easy to say, well, myself. And oftentimes I do choose to live for myself. But God's presence goes out into the world and strives against our spirit to try to convince us, to try to convey us, right? Again, let's go back to the John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. If he loved the world, then would he condemn the world? And that's exactly what the scripture says. He did not send Christ in the world to condemn it. So, let's answer this question. As we already have. Answer in two parts. God will not send the innocent to hell. 
But everybody who stands before God has been given a choice. There's no innocent. <coughs> God's general revelation has gone out to the world. So if I, I was, again, I know, so many tangents. Jesus is just a shortcut. Could you imagine being a Jewish person with the law? Here are over 600 ways you have to make sure you do things right. I can't even get two right. But Jesus is like, ah, it's like a shortcut, right? Remember Snakes and Ladders? It's a great game. But it's a very deep theological game too. Right? Because no matter what our sin is, it's a snake, down, down. But remember when you look on the board, there's always that one tall ladder that got you really fast up there? I, I never got that ladder. My sister got it every time. I think she cheated. I can't prove it. But in heaven, she'll be judged for it. But uh, she always got that ladder. It's like, I'm like, Argh! right? I never got the ladder. Jesus is the ladder. Just, right? You just get the, that shortcut. So why would we want to be missionaries? Why would we be out there in the world? Because Jesus is a shortcut. The law, general revelation, it's tough. Right? It's tough. Jesus, he's that ladder that goes almost to the very top that you really, really, really want. God will not send the innocent to hell. There is no one innocent. Let's bow our heads, let's pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You guys know what's going to happen next. I'm not going to make you do anything. But I do want you to think. Sometimes as Christ followers, we forget that we have the honor, the privilege of knowing the gospel. And I think it's always interesting to me how people prejudge their friends, their family. Oh, they would never be interested in the gospel. They'd never be interested in Jesus. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. But I do know this, that we can live our lives in such a way that there's something different about us that people are like, well, why? Why do you do this? Why do you live this way? And I think the gospel, is a, it has to be a key to that. I love the fact, and again, Don Richardson's book is so great for that. I love the fact that God's presence has gone out into the world throughout history, throughout time, and it has given every human being on the planet an opportunity to choose him as best as they can understand. But again, snakes and ladders, Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is that ladder. And we have to make sure that we are living in such a way that we are aligning ourselves with Christ. And maybe even in this moment, you can think of somebody close to you, you interact with maybe on a daily basis, and maybe you can ask yourself, have I, have I been a good representation of who Christ is? Have I just prejudged them so much that, ah, yeah, they're not going to, they're not going to, they're not interested in Jesus, they're not interested in faith. And maybe the Spirit can just maybe nudge you. And again, not that you have to take your Bible to work on or school on Monday and start slamming people on the heads with them. But you can be praying by the Holy Spirit that God would give you an opportunity to share, to speak, just to be Jesus to that individual. Dear Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you came to humanity. I thank you that you spoke to us, you taught us, but that you died for us as well too. And God, all of us here this morning, we can, we can just lay claim to that privilege of how beautiful, how incredibly special that act was for us. But Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that we would realize something about who you are, God, that you are a just God and a loving God. And Lord, that you have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, that we get the opportunity to live out our faith in a world that increasingly does not even recognize it. And I pray by this Holy Spirit that you would help us to speak, to behave, to act, to think, so that something about us, about who we are and what we believe, will draw those who are ready to hear the truth. God, I thank you that as I look throughout history, that I look through every people's group that's ever been, Lord, I love the fact that you've been there, that you've been speaking, that the earth has been speaking, 
the earth has been singing the hymns of who God is to these people groups. And I pray, Lord, that you would let us know that there is nobody in history who will stand before you who has not been given the opportunity to move their life in the direction towards you. Lord, thank you for your word, which is truth. In Jesus' name, amen.